Good evening, everyone. It's Dr. Tofai. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live, our weekly Q&A. Every Tuesday, we like to call it Hernia Talk Tuesdays. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I'm your hernia and laparoscopic mm -hmm. surgery specialist. Many of you are joining me via Zoom, also on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai. And thank you for following me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. I always post about every week's um, topics and as you know, towards the end, uh, I will upload this session and you can follow all the other 100 and I think six or seven hernia talk sessions uh, on my YouTube channel. So I wanted to take some time today to talk about uh, a very interesting topic, which I thought got really good reviews last Sunday. So last Sunday I was on um, a local society meeting they invited me to give a talk and I was told that the audience is not doctors it's like lay people some doctors um, but mostly like a local society so um, I taught them about you know trying to make my case for why it's not just a hernia and I put up this slide and I'm going to show you the slide and I'll read it for you as well and it basically was what doctors which doctor should know about hernias? So when you go to, let's say, your gynecologist or your medical doctor and you say, oh, I got bloating and I got this pain around my belly button, um, they should know that, you know, bloating and belly button pain may be related to a hernia at the belly button. Or if you go to your orthopedic surgeon and you're like, you know, every time I I jump and do all these other physical activities. I get this pain kind of in my groin area and it wraps around my hip. They should know that it's not necessarily a hip problem. The orthopedic surgeon, they should know there's also like, it could be a groin strain or a hernia. So I was making a list of like, okay, what doctors do I talk to and do I work with who have patients that I share with them? And the list got so long. It was literally, I had to stop because the font was getting too small <laughs> on my slide to fit all these doctors because certainly a family doctor, internal medicine or pediatrician should be aware of hernias and diagnose them and, and tell you to go see a, a hernia doctor or a surgeon. But also your gastroenterologist, I work with rheumatologists, nephrologists, hepatologists, infectious diseases doctors. You'd be surprised how many patients really need to get the right care for, let's say, a, a mesh infection, but the infectious diseases doctor or wound care doctor, let's say, maybe is just treating it like a wound infection, but really it's a mesh infection, which needs the mesh removed almost all the time with some exceptions. And yet they're never referred to. I have a, I have a, a lovely lady who's, who I'm planning on operating soon, who for years has had this chronically draining wound and her wound care doctor was just kept on treating it. And then it would heal, it would open up again because the underlying problem was never addressed. So um, pulmonologists, oncologists, nutrition, psychiatry, um, unfortunately psychiatry, yes, because I have patients that, well, I'll give you two scenarios. Um, one scenario is the severe depression and suicidal thoughts that run through the minds of patients that have chronic pain related to a hernia related complication. I personally know many patients who have killed themselves as a result of their chronic pain because they just saw no way out of their misery, even though, you know, potentially I could have helped them, but it just never got to that point. Um, but also, you know, I just learned um, a while ago, one of my patients is bulimic and I didn't know it was, it wasn't, I don't ask people, are you bulimic? Um, it's not part of my history. They didn't offer it to me. And this person kept getting hernia after hernia. Well, of course, if you're vomiting every time you eat and you're inducing vomit after meals as a form of coping or depression or eating disorder, then yeah, that's really important information for your hernia surgeon. And once I fix that hernia, there's no way you should be vomiting afterwards because you're going to mess up my hernia surgery. So uh, I enlisted the, the help of a psychiatrist and helped my patient 
because bulimia is a psychiatric disorder more than anything. And um, it's not purely like, I just want to lose weight. So uh, that's why I put that one in there. Um, sports medicine, obviously, for uh, reasons of like groin strain and so on. We talk about wound care, gynecology, obstetrics, um, urology, plastic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, colorectal surgeon, thoracic surgeon, neurosurgeon, liver and kidney transplant surgeon, surgical oncologist, trauma, bariatric surgeon, anesthesiologist, pain management, radiologist, vascular surgeons. These are all doctors that somehow interact with me in my life as a hernia surgeon. And I hope to educate them about some problem that is related to my hernia surgery world. And I learn from them um, about problems that maybe are referred to me because oh maybe it's a hernia, but it's really not. It's something in their in their world. So uh, I thought today we would discuss that because in retrospect, it always happens. Every time I have a, a show and I'm trying to come up with a topic that would be of interest, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, this last week was like the perfect scenario of, of example. So for example, uh, today alone, actually today and yesterday, I should say today and yesterday, I have talked to at least seven or eight of these different specialists. Well, uh, I just got a call from a urologist where um, the patient had, I believe, some type of trauma and is, has testicular pain, but he's thinking maybe the pain is related to a hernia and not related to the testicle. That's a urology issue. Um, I have a lady who had uh, pregnancies and uh, three pregnancies, and so definitely had this disruption of her abdominal wall with a hernia and a diastasis recti. So I referred her to plastic surgeons in my town who I really respect um, to get her, get a tummy tuck because the hernia itself was not the main problem. It was really the diastasis and the, and the loose skin. So work with plastic surgeons there. Sometimes they ask me to come in to do the hernia repair part and they do the tummy tuck part. I had a gentleman who flew in who had hernia surgery and now he's got horrible, horrible headaches. So he's been seeing, getting MRIs of the brain and working with neurologists. And then um, he had a rheumatology workup. Of course, I think he's reacting to the mesh with Asia syndrome, but it's rheumatology workup because he's got um, uh, joint pains and then neurologist for his headache and tingling in the, in the fingers and um, these weird rashes. So I'm sending him to an allergist immunologist because I need them to do allergy testing to different meshes and sutures so that when I remove his mesh, I know what kind of sutures to use so he doesn't react to that. But interestingly, he's already had some blood tests and that shows that he has some maybe immunologic problem. So he's gonna see an immunologist for that. And interestingly, another patient out of state who had hernia surgery and is reacting to the mesh locally. So he doesn't have like headache, hair loss, numbness and tingling and feeling hot. He just has a very stiff area where the hernia repair was. And it looks like he's locally reacting to the mesh because it's stiffened up. And he, so he has an abnormally high inflammatory response to the mesh. And guess what? He was diagnosed with something called MGUS, which is monoclonal gammopathy of un, undetermined significance. And I was like, hmm, you're a normal, healthy person. You had this hernia repair, and all of a sudden you get this weird diagnosis. I wonder if it's related. So I spoke to his, I called over and spoke to his hematologist. And I said, you know, I do this work, you know, I'm a hernia surgeon. You're a fancy hematologist. Um, I wonder if the patient is reacting to his mesh and he's manifesting this reaction as this new gamma, gammopathy, the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And the, the hematologist said, oh my God, you're absolutely right. It, what? This is so interesting. Yes, it completely can be. 
In fact, this specific disease, MGUS or MGUS, I think it's called, is known to be triggered by autoimmune disorders or other kind of um, inflammatory problems. So yeah, absolutely. So he got all excited, which I love because I got excited and he got excited. So that meant that I was on the right track. And um, so the plan is we're gonna take out the mesh and then repeat the labs in three months to see if that is something that maybe we'll get a cure. Maybe removing the mesh will now get rid of not only the pain he's having from the, the mesh, but also this other second diagnosis. Those are just like examples. I have more. Um, uh, there's a patient with like a potential neuroma and the MRI is kind of like, he's very complicated. Anyway, so I'm working with a musculoskeletal radiologist to work and read. I don't want them to look, say, oh yeah, no hernia. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to specifically look in this one area where there may be a neuroma and that's the cause for his chronic pain because there's been issues like that before. Um, another patient came to me who was headed toward pain management. And I'm like, why are you going to pain management? I think you have a hernia. Oh, well, I, I assume that the, my pain was because I had a muscle strain and my doctor was going to just do like a PRP injection, which we've talked before in sports medicine for groin strains. And so I, I said, hold on, let's see if you don't just have like a simple hernia because surgery will cure that. And then if that's true, so I called the pain doctor, he's like, absolutely right. Go ahead and get the imaging. If it's something that you have to handle, then great. If not, we'll take care of it with uh, the sports injection. So my point is this, there's so many specialists that we interact with. I have another patient with a mesh infection, unfortunately. And, um, you know, infectious diseases, I learned a lot from them as to what antibiotics and for how long and so on um, before, you know, they need their mesh removed. So on that note, let me take some of your questions, but specifically, um, I hope to impart on you this hour, number one, that hernia surgeons, like me and my colleagues who you've met on Hernia Talk Live. Um, we interact with specialists all the time. And it's one of the part of my job that I really love because though a lot of people think hernia surgeons, they just fix hernias. Uh, I actually really like the multidisciplinary approach to it. And I'll discuss that in more detail because uh, there are some questions that were submitted uh, that we'll review on that note. But also, I hope, I hope that what I do in terms of giving talks and lectures and answering questions and writing papers, that other specialists also reach out to me. I just had a cardiologist call me to, uh, yesterday and we've shared some patients, but I've never really like met the guy. And he, I know he's a great cardiologist. So I was really honored that he called me um, say, Hey, we should meet because I hear so many great things. Your reputation is so great. And my patients are so happy and I do cardiology and, and, you know, he wants to learn more about what I do because every so often we'll get a patient that maybe I can help. So, um, that's kind of, I, I, I love what I do and I, I don't feel like it's a, it's like a very, Isolated specialty. I feel like I talk and work with so many different specialties. Um, okay, here's some questions you guys are asking. Oh, the, the, the talk about suicide, right? So one question is how common is suicide because of chronic post-operative inguinal hernia pain? And what does someone do if they have these thoughts? And a follow-up question is, is suicide more common after hernia surgery complications and pain than other causes of pain? Well, yeah, so chronic pain is always an issue and it can give people suicidal thoughts. Pain is just a horrible, horrible thing to live with, regardless of the reason. It could be back pain, cancer related pain is a big one. Um, people who are amputees that have pain from their amputations um, and definitely hernia related complications. So I personally know several patients who have killed themselves 
those of us who do this for a living all know about patients. In fact, I believe Dr. Jacob and Dr. Ramshaw have both given public talks about their experience in um, dealing with uh, the situation where patients are in such high level suicide and chronic pain and um, even shared stories of their patients who eventually killed themselves. And I believe Dr. Jacob is working on kind of a revolutionary way of trying to change the direction of that because there's a lot of new medications that are in trials that are related to microdosing of uh, otherwise illicit drugs that have been able to help these patients. The reason why hernia surgery related pain is so hard is usually in the groin for men. It's often a male issue because they have testicular pain or sexual pain in addition to the groin hernia pain. And that can augment the severity of the depression associated with it. Um, they lose their loved one. They can't sit, they can't enjoy their life. And that's kind of part of the problem. Um, not to say that I haven't had patients or known about patients who've, who've become suicidal from abdominal wall, but really it's the pelvis and groin ones that that I know of that are, are in the worst shape and just, you know, lose hope. And then they're afraid to have more surgery because they're told they, they may lose a testicle or they've already lost a testicle or and so on. So um, I can't say it's any worse than like, let's say cancer pain or amputee pain or traumatic pains, like if you're in bad trauma and you had, you know, you flew through a window or it got hit by a car or something like that, but it's, it's, um, it's up there. We don't see people with, let's say plastic surgery who, who get suicidal or gynecology. They don't, they're not typically suicidal, but in my field, there are, there, there is that risk. All right, let's ask some more questions. So Moving on, here's another question, which is, do hernia patients tend to have more comorbidities and benefit more from a multidisciplinary approach than other surgical patients? The answer is absolutely yes, and yet it's one of the least appreciated aspects of hernia surgery. I always say, it's not just a hernia, and I don't mean that, that um, it's not just a hernia, but it's not just a hernia. In other words, everyone in the past you used to think, ah, it's just a hernia, you know, uh, and they operated on everyone. And now we know if you're morbidly obese, if you're a nicotine user, if you have a chronic cough, if you're constipated, if your prostate is enlarged, if you have any wound infection, any um, infection in the area, these are all situations where you should not just jump into surgery. And in my patients, your diabetes needs to get, get uh, dealt with. You need to have um, colorectal surgeon evaluate you for something. You may need a colonoscopy prior to your hernia surgery. These are all not to delay your surgery, but intended to improve your outcome. And I have a lot of colleagues that don't believe in that. They, I've heard, I've literally heard surgeons say, oh, well, my patient just wants a hernia repaired. Um, if I delay that, they're just going to go to another surgeon uh, and get their hernia repaired. First of all, neither of you should be operating on a patient who's diabetic, diabetes is out of whack, they're morbidly obese, they have a chronic cough, or have anything else that could potentially give a worse outcome. Uh, you have to correct those, and I do that. And I do it unapologetically, and if a patient just wants their hernia repaired and doesn't care to go through the process, that's not appropriate. I don't think uh, that's the right attitude and, and I certainly don't subscribe to it. Um, but there is a little bit of that, which is there are surgeons and unfortunately, it's part of the medical system in the United States, especially that uh, hernia surgery is not a very profit-making 
specialty, which means that the reimbursements from insurance, Medicare, uh, et cetera, is very low. So most doctors who do hernia surgery as one of many operations they do live on a volume-based system. And that means they have to see a lot of patients and operate a lot. And if you're making you know several hundred dollars per surgery, you do like thousands of operations. So you can't, you don't have the luxury of, of reducing the volume. I mean, you should, but it's, it's the system doesn't help, doesn't promote that. Um, I have pushed myself outside of that system so that I'm not bound by those kind of limitations. And so I do spend more time educating my patient to get their outcomes better. You know, I don't know if that made it what sense to you, but here's another surgery or another question. Uh, what I've been told about the risks of corrective or additional surgery is causing more trauma to tissues in a region where the nerves are already quote angry or hypersensitized and this risk trumps potential benefit of additional surgery um okay so i don't agree with that i do know that if you have had multiple operations and are in a situation where your chronic pain is out of control then surgery while your chronic pain is out of control is not a good idea because um, you need to work with your pain doctor to bring down your pain control issues to a much more manageable state before undergoing any hernia or reconstructive surgery. That's true for any surgery. However, if you truly would benefit from an operation and you'd happen to have chronic pain, that's not an indication not to provide the surgery. It's there's chronic pain, there's chronic pain. Like you need to get the chronic pain under some control and not be completely out of whack. But if the surgery is going to help you, then it'll help you. Um, nerve surgery is different story. I do agree that we should minimize as much surgery we do as we do on the nerve itself. And if you're at a heightened level of neuropathic pain, then that should be controlled. Otherwise you are at risk of being pushed into like a a Crips or complex regional pain syndrome situation. But to just tell everyone, oh, you're in, you know, um, I'm just going to cause more trauma and you're going to be in more pain means that you're not working with pain doctors. Here we go again, other doctors where you got to bring them in, work with other pain doctors in a multidisciplinary manner and say, I need this patient's pain better controlled. Because for that doctor, the pain control may be adequate. But for you as a surgeon, you're going to be inflicting more pain. And so you need to bring down the baseline pain before you add on to that patient's pain in the acute early stage of the operation. And that's a different situation. So when you work with your pain doctors and explain that to them, they should understand that maybe they need extra whatever to get them through the surgical to, uh, through the surgical hump. Okay, next question is, how often and why are other specialists needed for your patients? I tell you, for me, I love working with other specialists. So even if I don't need to bring them on, I often reach out to them anyway. I'll give you an example. Um, I saw a lady with a colostomy and she's concerned she has a colostomy uh, peristomal hernia. And, you know, it ran through my mind, like, why are we even dealing with a peristomal hernia? Why don't we just consider putting her bowels back together and taking down the colostomy? So that's where, you know, the patient may not be open to it initially, but I would like to know, is this a good patient to consider at least discussing a colostomy takedown? So then the hernia repair would be much more straightforward and you don't have to deal with the, the colostomy and the, maybe the patient will be happier not living with the colostomy for the rest of her life or is this patient high risk and would do poorly with a colostomy takedown because I don't do colostomy takedowns I used to back in the day when I was a general surgeon um, saving lives at the county hospital but I'm a hernia specialist now so I defer 
those operations to people who do it for a living and they do a much better job because uh, that's what they do. And so I also know that there's new technologies and new ways of thinking. So I'm constantly reaching out to these specialists because I learn from them. Um, and they may say, oh yeah, well, an elderly patient, for example, would not benefit from a colostomy takedown if a certain amount of their colon has been removed because their colon lacks the ability to adapt to being shorter. And so now they have looser stools and maybe that lady's had like three or four kids already. So she's gonna be incontinent. So patients would actually rather have a colostomy than be incontinent. And so no, let's not take down the colostomy. Like those are like thought processes, which I think I love. I love having that thought process and like tailoring decision-making to the needs of the patient. Uh, next question, what medications have you seen that are helpful to tamp down post-surgery pain to make the patient a more success, more acceptable candidate for revisional surgery? Could it be a lidocaine patch, capsaicin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, or other maneuvers? Actually, it's a very wide range. So it could include um, nerve modulating um, uh, pain medications, muscle relaxants, local um, medications, CBD, uh, marijuana can be helpful if it's legal in your state, a topical uh, arnica creams, gels, a binder, um, or it could be injections. So I have a patient who is in such severe pain, not from the hernia, but from her back, but she wants her hernia repaired. There's no way I'm going to offer a hernia repair to someone who has out of control spinal pain because I'm never going to be able to, to control her pain after surgery if she's got like 10 out of 10 pain from her spine already. And then I'm going to add an, a pain for her hernia surgery. And her hernia is not even painful. I know it's a hernia, but not all hernias need to be repaired. So that's kind of the situation. But yeah, there are different patches. The lidocaine patches are great. Um, there are some CBD patches and Arnica creams, topical uh, anti-inflammatory creams. Um, sometimes um, um, different nerve medications could also function as antidepressants to help with the pain control. Anti-anxiety medications can help with pain control. So it's a wide range, very wide range. And that's where having a couple of really good pain doctors in your back pocket is really great. So I have my own. So in my town, I have my own group of doctors who I really respect, who many of them treat me <laughs> or my family or my close friends. And they um, are my go-to. So sometimes I refer patients to them, but sometimes I just give them a call. And I say, hey, listen, can I ask you a question? And they give me um, great, great information and I learn from them. How painful would you consider abdominal wall reconstruction for ventral hernia repair? Depends on the type of surgery. So open laparoscopic or robotic. Depends on how large your hernia is. So small, medium, large, extra large. Um, and which area of the body it is and how much like uh, you weigh and how much pain you have before surgery. So that's a very, very hard question. It's like saying, um, what car do you recommend I buy? Like, what do you need it for? So, sorry, I can't exactly answer that question. What are the specialists to whom you most often refer? Okay, so top are um, gynecology and urology and some orthopedic surgery and pain, pain management. Those are the top four. So orthopedics, pain management, uh, gynecology, and urology. And I have amazing, amazing doctors who I work with for them. But like this week, I've also spoken to a hematologist, a musculoskeletal radiologist, allergist, immunologist, rheumatologist. Um, who else did I talk to this week? Cardiologist, neurologist, uh, and so on, but they're not as not as commonly uh, needed. Pulmonologist, that's another good one. ENT doctor, gastroenterologist. Um, it's pretty interesting <laughs> the wide range of doctors that uh, I speak with, and I learn so much from them. 
And let me tell you what I do is I kind of sneak in a little bit of my own information. For example, the hematologist that I spoke to, I guarantee you he never knew that meshes can cause a mesh reaction ever. And yet there's so many patients I'm sure he's had who have had hernia repairs with mesh. And as a hematologist, dealing with these new like kind of autoimmune kind of disorders um, or gammopathies, blood disorders that can be triggered by autoimmune problems, it's important to know that maybe it's your mesh. So the fact that I, I kind of introduced myself because he's in a different state and brought up the issue. And I said, I kind of brought it up as, you know, this is what I do. I see patients that react and this is the kind of reaction they get. Can it be? And then he's like, like a light bulb went off. It's like, yes, so cool. All right, in which setting among diagnosis, pre-surgery optimization, and post-operative management is a multidisciplinary approach most useful for hernia patients? So I would say definitely pre-operative optimization and sometimes diagnosis. I don't use them as much post-operatively, mostly because the patients that you, the, the type of doctors you need post-operatively are very different than the doctors you need pre-operatively. So post-operatively, you need pain doctors, maybe a cardiologist or a pulmonologist or a gastroenterologist, depending on their, like, maybe a complication or a wound care doctor, maybe infectious diseases doctor, because these may all be related to complications after surgery. But before surgery, I like to get the, the other specialists involved to make sure I'm not missing another diagnosis or um, I optimize an underlying diagnosis, and so on. Next question. How often have you found that problems appearing after hernia surgery are fixed by other specialists without resorting to further surgery? How often do you found that problems appearing after hernia surgery are fixed by other specialists without resorting to further surgery? Hmm. Not that often. I think the question has to do with, for example, a patient has, let's say, nerve pain after hernia surgery, and then the pain doctor gives them, I don't know, a, a pain pump or injection or something like that. But not not common, not common. What is the role of a pain specialist? Okay, let's discuss that. So there are pain specialists and there are pain specialists. Some pain specialists are really good at um, chronic pain. So others are really good at acute pain. Another group of pain doctors is very good at like just the spine, but really nothing else. Everything is a nerve pain to them. Others are really good at kind of um, physical medicine, rehabilitation related stuff like sports medicine. So they can deal with injecting areas where there's a strain of a muscle or a torn adductor or something like that. And then some are really good at just procedures. So you want to go to that doctor for your epidural and your um, implant placement for spinal stimulator, but they're not necessarily like the most gifted in diagnosing your actual problem um, but they're really good technical doctors. So it's a wide range not, and I have my own kind of group of doctors. So I know um, there's one doctor who's really, really good at procedures, but I don't send my like suicidal patient to them, but I have other patients that are like super suicidal and everything is negative and the whole world is falling apart. And um, there's a group of pain doctors that I specifically send those patients to because man, they've had really good success at turning around these patients to um, uh, treat their patient, to treat their medical um, and psychological problems at the same time, which is really hard to do. And um, we've had a couple of patients that were, I thought, wow, how is this ever going to get fixed? And now they're like normal, live normal lives. So very, very um, unique qualities. Next question. I have a soccer ball size hernia and abdominal reconstruction will be done too. What is long? What's the length of recovery? 
and what are the chances of recurrence? Okay, again, very difficult to answer. The chance of recurrence are related to your surgeon, their surgical technique, how much mesh was put in, how wide of a mesh, how big your current defect is, how much you weigh, what other risk factors you have. Are you constipated? Do you have a chronic cough? Do you use nicotine? How, how, um, how much you weigh, how tall you are, and how many operations you've had before. Do you have any other medical disorders, diabetes, autoimmune disorders? Are you on medications that, that affect your immune system and healing? These are all, you know, how old you are. These are all related, like multifactorial reasons for why that will con contribute to your recurrence. Um, the size is soccer ball. Soccer ball is huge. <laughs> this is a huge. So is that all hernia? That's what I want to know because what you're seeing as a bulge may not be the actual size of the defect. I estimate what people see is about three times larger than what the actual defect in the muscle is. So if you're saying soccer ball size, does that mean that's how you look? Um, and then therefore, how do you kind of uh, like give imaging? Just tell me exactly how wide the, that is. And the recovery typically for abdominal wall reconstruction is a couple of weeks. For the really, really, really complicated ones, maybe several months but uh, typically it's a couple of weeks. Next question, do you do Zoom consults for out-of-state patients? So, so the US law and California state law allows me to take care of new patients in California, but not outside of California. So the way I get around that system is within California, yes, I do offer um, in-person and virtual consultations. So telehealth, which means like Zoom based. I get to see you, I talk to you, I, I can kind of visually examine you. Um, we have a good discussion back and forth. But, um, and then we, you know, we, uh, it can go through your insurance, et cetera, because you're, you're treated as a bona fide patient doctor relationship. Unfortunately, since the pandemic um, is, is kind of settled down, uh, they have cracked down on the type of care we can give to out of state. So since I'm not licensed to give care outside of California, because our medical licenses are state-based, then if you're outside of California, what I can offer you is my expert opinion on your situation. So I'm not really your doctor. I can't write you orders or, you know, prescribe anything for you. Um, that would have to be through your own medical doctor. But what we do is what we offer is online consultation. So that's for anyone outside of California, whether it's the United States or international. And um, take all your records, your medical records, imaging, your story. We have forms to fill out and send the, those to me by mail. I'll sit down on my off time and I'll review them. And I'll send you a very, very detailed, complete long email, which... Um, is kind of my opinion of what's going on based on the information you provide me, understanding that I don't have the privilege to actually examine you. And many patients find that helpful because they'll take that to their doctor and they say, hey, so she saw this, what do you think? Or she recommends that, can you offer me that, that service? Or they figure out that, you know, I brought some insight into their care that they weren't getting near them. And now that they know I can help them, they will make an appointment to physically come in to see me. So um, there is that option for what we call online consultation. I also want to take a little moment and to give a shout out to all my patients from today. Um, almost every patient today told me that they watch Hernia Talk and they will be going home and watching me. Um, <laughs> Uh, after their their visit, in fact, one surge, one doc, one patient, I believe, is driving home now, like to another state, and maybe listening to me online um, while they are driving. So I do really appreciate that. I'm very impressed that you all find this valuable, and I do appreciate that extra little push to have me do this every single week. Uh, okay, what is the role of the interventional musculoskeletal radiologist? So you may recall a mm, couple of months ago, many months ago, that I interviewed Dr. Jan Fritz from NYU, New York University. He used to work at Johns Hopkins. 
So he is an interventional musculoskeletal radiologist, which means he's really good at looking at imaging from a muscle and nerve standpoint. And in doing so, he diagnoses things and then he, under MRI or CAT scan or ultrasound guidance, he will inject or ablate nerves that a typical pain doctor, for example, would not be able to do. I also have a really talented musculoskeletal radiologist at Cedar sinai my hospital, who is so good with the hip, he'll do injections and specifically aim at certain areas to inject. And then I went, I reached out to him for a patient. I said, listen, I have this patient. This is exactly what's wrong with her. There's just one nerve, the, the genital femoral nerve got injured from her spine surgery approach from the side. And I can't inject that area because it's way back and there's psoas to her back. But if I show it to you on the imaging, can you inject it? He's like, uh, never done that before, but sure. So this woman was in so much pain. She had a, a spine surgery and the spine surgery was fine. Like her spine pain got, but now she's got this new horrible pain that radiates into her kind of labia. And basically, basically she had an, um, either injury or more likely scar tissue from her spine surgery uh, that originated way back in her back, at this, uh, but not at the spine. So I, I, I marked the area where he needs to enter. And then he went and looked at the imaging and I told him exactly where the point is of the imaging. And then, so it was like two centimeters over here, one centimeter over there. Anyway, he went in and injected it based on my collaboration. So now I'm collaborating with a radiologist and oh my God, that woman was so happy she was on cloud nine. Her pain was completely gone. She only needed two injections and it was gone, gone, like completely healed. And he was so excited because first of all, he'd never done that before. Second of all, he was collaborating with me. So we learned something new. And third, as a radiologist, you almost never cure anyone. You're basically, you know, helping diagnose, but you're not really treating as much. And he was able to like completely change the life of this woman. So um, those are like stories that I, that I absolutely love. And that's where the role of a musculoskeletal radiologist is very important because they really understand, um, that part of kind of life and the, the part of, um, the anatomy really well. And sometimes someone like me will bring in the clinical aspect. Like, I believe this is the diagnosis. And then I work with a radiologist, let's say, that understands like the anatomical approach. And so you bring clinical and anatomical together, and then you can kind of get this lovely relationship where, <laughs> where um, you know, we're able to treat patients together. And the great thing about my practice, which I see that it's kind of harder to do when you're uh, in in a kind of high volume institution based practice is I have a I have a cell phone that I have not I have not erased phone numbers since I was a resident and that was over 20 years ago many of these residents that I was with or attending surgeons that I was with are now doctors that I work with <laughs> so I have their cell phone I have people's cell phones from across the United States or even out, outside the United States and I call them and I talk to them and I refer to them or I just kind of discuss with them. You know, what you don't see sometimes is like at night, I may be on Twitter or Instagram and we may, I may be direct messaging with colleagues of mine about um, situations, clinical situations, questions, et cetera. So I love that part of it. And I feel that in general, people think that a hernia is, oh, it's just a hernia. Um, but the collaborative part is so important. And uh, like I said, today's topic was an offshoot from my talk on Sunday, which was basically exactly this, where I went through every specialist. I went through gastroenterology, allergy, um, gynecology, obstetrics, urology, et cetera, infectious diseases, pulmonology, 
a hepatology tra liver transplant surgeons, and I explain how each of those specialists need to know about hernia surgery, hernias, because we interlay. For example, um, did you know that as a rheumatologist, there are certain autoimmune disorders that affect the joints? You know that, rheumatoid arthritis. There's a di diagnosis called ankylosing spondylitis. And that is where your sacroiliac joint in the back of your pelvis, in the back on the left and right side, gets inflamed. Um, it's often seen in people of Northern European, like Norway, Sweden, kind of Scandinavian um, genetics. Uh, if you do a blood test, they tend to be HLA-B27 positive. And, and when you get that lower back pain on the left and right, it radiates to the groin. So I have literally treated patients that were incorrectly diagnosed with hernia pain because they had groin pain and shoot it down to their inner thigh and maybe their testicle. And then they had hernia surgery. And guess what? The pain was still there. So now they're labeled as, as post inguinal herniorrhaphic chronic pain. And they had mesh removals and spermatic cord denervation surgery. And they were told they have to get their testicle chopped off and all that. And it was always an ankylosing spondylitis. So all you need to do put them on these autoimmune, autoimmune medication, not surgery medication, and maybe some injections into the, into the um, joint. And that treats your pain. Um, we talked about the monoclonal, monoclonal gammopathy, which was another one, which uh, was kind of unique. Um, the other one was bloating. So did you know that hernias cause bloating. So most people who have bloating go see their medical doctor or their gastroenterologist. And I just saw a patient this week, just tons and tons and tons of surgeries and endoscopy, colonoscopy, hydrogen, um, hydrogen breath test, H. pylori uh, bacterial um, uh, uh, testing and treatment, different types of diet controls. She was told she's got IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, which is kind of like everyone is labeled somehow that way. Um, what else? Anyway, long story short, the bloating may be from the hernia. Let me fix the hernia and the bloating can go away. Um, did you know that endometriosis can cause bloating? So this patient I saw um, I think I figured out her, her problem. She was down to 80 pounds. Can you believe that? Eight zero. No one who's an adult should be 80 pounds. And she was tall too. Um, she just so much pain eating, can't eat. And, you know, unfortunately, when you fall into this situation where you've got bloating, these kind of nonspecific abdominal pains, et cetera, and all the studies come back normal or you're not, you get labeled, therefore, with like IBS, um, and you get put on all these medications for IBS, which don't really like, I mean, if you have true IBS, it'll work, but it doesn't work otherwise. And then it doesn't work, so then she becomes like labeled as like difficult patient. And meanwhile, she's kind of going downhill, 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 because she has kind of bloating, and now she's 80 pounds. So. What happened was the, uh, I looked her imaging and I said, you got this big ovarian cyst. Oh yeah, we know about that. They just told me it's a simple cyst, not big enough to cause my pain. I said, but hold on, you've had this pain since age 17. Guess what? That's kind of when the menses started. So, and you've had endometriosis. Why is this an ovarian cyst and not an endometrioma? And this huge colon that's sitting on top of your ovarian cyst, which is probably endometriosis, is very abnormal. It's like really wide, dilated colon, not stool is not moving through it. I said, this is your endometriosis. We just need to treat it. It's not a hernia. Thanks for coming to see me, but I can't help you because it's not a hernia. But I can help you try and get through to the right 
specialists. So maybe this bloating and this GI problem is from a gynecologic problem. So let's go down that route. And in fact, it's been worse since she's been off her medication for endometriosis. So put two and two together and maybe that was a problem. Here's another question. My doctor wants to use a mesh for my epigastric hernia. I heard using mesh is not good for us. Um, I don't know what that means, not good for us. Uh, if you need mesh, then you should have a discussion with your doctor as to the pros and cons of using mesh in you and you know how that can help. There are patients where I prefer not to use mesh, but the majority of patients do well with mesh. And if you have a larger hernia, you may need mesh. If it's a smaller epigastric hernia, like one centimeter, I don't use mesh, even one and a half centimeters. But if it's two centimeters or more, I usually use mesh because there's no good treatment for that. Do epigastric hernias cause bloating too? Yes, they can. These specialists you call need to know how meshes can interfere with their diagnosis. Yes, so this whole hematologist was so excited about it. And then who was it? There's another one recently where, oh, okay. So this other patient, um, normal healthy guy, uh, flew in from out of state to see me um, today. So he doing fine, gets mesh in, wakes up with all these problems. He's got ringing in the ear, hair loss, tingling in the fingers, rashes around his back, um, um, twitching of his body all over the place. Uh, things like that. So to me, that sounds like a mesh reaction, but of course it can be other things potentially. We've got to rule it out. Oh, headache, major, major headache. Headache top of his head. So he's had MRI brain, CT brain, more MRI brain, neurologists. They're all looking for like a head thing. Um, not linking the fact that it could be related to the surgery he just had because he was fine before that um got uh allergy testing and immunology testing finally which is good uh that very very helpful uh he's got ringing in the ear so he's going to go see an ENT doctor but I hope his ENT doctor first of all rules out a, a bona fide ear reason uh for the ringing in the ear which very well may be however if not that ENT I hope is then told, okay, so it's not that, but do know that people that get mesh put in can get this weird reaction where they get ringing in the ear. So you're absolutely right. We need to kind of close that loop. And that's why I give these talks and, you know, um, try and educate people, including doctors, how much kind of mesh and hernia can interfere with other I got a phone call today, another a patient of mine I, I operated on like 10 years ago, and she had had a lot of complicated surgeries before me, and I fixed her hernia and she's been doing great, but now she's in another hospital, they want to operate on her for another reason, and the doctor was like concerned, like, so the patient was concerned, like, don't touch my mesh, Dr. Tofai said, if I ever need surgery, call me, because, call her, because um, she, she did a painstaking operation and put this mesh in me and don't want to get messed up. So the doctor called me, very nice surgeon. He's like, listen, I don't think I need to operate on her, but if I do, I need your advice. Like now she has mesh in her. So I kind of gave him advice as to what needs to be done. And I sent him my operative report, um, of hers so that he has like a roadmap a little bit to understand what was done and what's there. But you may need to have a surgery through someone's mesh. You need to understand what that means. What does that imply? Can you just cut through the mesh? Will that mesh get infected? What suture do I use to close the, the do I use the same, do I close the fascia the same way I close regular fascia or is the fact that there's meshes there is different? So that's very important. There are some other topics like low back pain. Did you know? that hernias can cause back pain. Belly button hernia can cause back pain. Groin hernias for sure can cause back pain. So I have literally had patients that have known back problems. So they go to their doctor. Oh, send you to a spine surgeon. They go to a spine surgeon. Oh yeah, you've got 
it's not that bad, but yeah, we should do surgery for your spine. They come to me, I said, okay, hold on. Your groin hernia may have, may, or your belly button hernia may be causing this back pain. Let me fix the hernia first. And back pain goes away. So they didn't need spine surgery after all. But very important that doctors stop sending patients to physical therapy and spine surgery because of back pain if they have a hernia, because it could all be from the hernia. Not all the time, but it helps. Um, what else did we discuss on, on Sunday? It, it was a pretty good talk. I talked about constipation and chronic cough. You know, a lot of these doctors uh, who treat cough and constipation, it's all they see. And so um, it's good for them to understand that by treating the constipation or the cough, they're actually helping the patient from a hernia standpoint. Um, what I don't like is when doctors are not open to feedback. So I would call the spine surgeon and say, listen, the patient flew in from Canada to see me. They have a bulge in their abdominal wall. It's not a hernia. It's likely a disc problem. And they'll say, oh, that never happens. What do you mean? Abdominal wall bulge. I said, well, you know, kind of like, the nerve to the abdominal wall is pinched somewhere in the spine. And so that nerve that feeds the muscle is now injured. So they have a bulging abdominal wall. So let's send them to you, the spine surgeon, take a look at the spine. And then if there's impinged nerve, you can fix that and the abdominal wall will get better. He's like, that's ridiculous. Are they have pain? No, then that's, that's not it. Really? So I get imaging. I prove that there's a disc. Send it back to the doctor, doesn't believe me. So I sent him to another doctor who believed me, operated on the patient, the patient was normal. Another spine surgeon was looking at imaging. Now granted, very, 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 very rare hernia. A sciatic notch hernia is the rarest of all hernias, sciatic notch hernia. I've treated one so far. They didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> There was a loop of intestine going through the area where the, the sciatic nerve goes through and it was causing sciatic pain. So they got imaging, oh, you probably have a disc. And they saw this like mass next to the nerve, which was a bowel. They didn't think it was bowel. They thought it was a tumor. So they said, oh shoot, you got a schwannoma or a nerve, nerve tumor. So for like, I don't know, like a year or two, they like kept getting imaging after imaging. Let's watch this tumor and see if it grows or how bad it is. And then someone sent her to me and said, there's bowel in this. And I said, oh yeah, that's a sciatic notch hernia. I'll fix it. And of course that's all she needed. So, you know, these are all like, um, you know, little tidbits that, you know, I have a lot of stories like this, a lot of stories. So that's why I kind of enjoyed giving this talk on Sunday because I just shared story after story after story and had pictures of patients of mine before and after. And it was really great talk. And hopefully if they, I do believe they recorded it. So if they can share with me the recording, then I will share it with you guys to, um, cause I thought it was a good talk. I'll post it on YouTube and I'll let you guys know when that happens. But um, it was kind of cool. There was a, a talk about um, uh, hepatologist, you know, I had a patient who has a hernia and has really, really bad liver disease. Her belly is like out to here, huge, huge. She looks like she's 20 months pregnant and thin lady as most liver failure patients are. And what happened is she got a hernia. Well, listen, I can't fix all hernias. Uh, a hernia in someone who is end stage liver disease, a hernia repair can kill you. So she needs to be better controlled with her liver disease so that the liver disease is under control and then that can fix the hernia. But if you have out of control liver disease, the hernia surgery may kill you. So that was like an issue. Um, 
I'm working, coordinating with her hepatologist saying, listen, I know you sent this patient to me, but you do know that she's got like, uncom like decompensated liver disease. He said, actually, I do know that. And I knew that if I send him, send her to you, that you would do the right thing and tell her exactly what we've been trying to tell her, um, which is you need better control of your liver. You'd be more compliant with your medical treatment of the liver disease. And so thank you. First of all, I hope, I wish they had told me that to begin with and not tested me, but it was kind of nice that they said, that's exactly why we specifically sent her to you because we knew that you would do the right thing and educate her how important it is to be medically compliant for your her for your liver failure um, uh, before uh, submitting to any hernia surgery. And um, we knew that you would not just willy-nilly offer her hernia surgery. So on that note, I want to thank you everyone for for being with me. Oh, quick question. Is triple endorectomy for chronic post-operative hernia repair pain ever available, a, a viable alternative as a last resort? Mm, only if it's nerve problem. How does it compare to dorsal root ganglion stimulator implant? Totally different disease process. Totally different disease process. Um, if someone's trying to tell you that's equivalent, it's not. A triple neurectomy or any neurectomy is purely intended to deal with nerve pain and not chronic pain that's not nerve related. All right, that was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too. We have a great guest next week. I'm really excited. Um, in the meantime, enjoy your evening. I'm peace out, Dr. Tofai here. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc on Facebook at Dr. Tofai. Many of you are here already on Facebook. Do tune in on my YouTube channel and subscribe so that every week you get an announcement of when I post new episodes of Hernia Talk Live. And I will see you again next week. Thanks, everyone. Always a pleasure. Bye. <laughs>